May God be with you. So with you. The Holy Gospel from our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And Jesus said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of Christ. In the name of one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of our lives. Amen. In our texts today, we have three examples. I was reflecting on it. I think we have three examples of faith. Um, specifically faith, as it, as it pertains to knowing and being known. Uh, and so I wanted to reflect on each of those examples. I mean, the first, uh, let's start with the Psalm, Psalm 139. It's a Psalm of David. And again, a Psalm is a song. So this is an ancient song that David, the Jewish king, the Hebrew king of Israel would have sung. Um, we, you, choir did a, a lovely rendition, or we did a lovely rendition of it here. Um, but Psalm 139 reads, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my laying down and are acquainted with all my ways, even before a tongue, a word is on my tongue. Oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, so high that I cannot contain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol in the place of the dead, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the seas, even there your hand shall lead me. Surely the darkness shall cover me and the light become night around me. But even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day. For it was you who formed me in my inward parts. You knit together me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made and wonderful are all your ways. How weighty are your thoughts, O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. I try to count them, and they are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. I'm struck in the, in the, the context of this psalm that, um, in some sense, David's mind is being blown. I, I, you know, I equate it to the, um, you know, when I was a boy, and I'd sit out in the backyard, and I would look up at the stars, and I would ponder infinity, right, and, and try to think about infinity, the sense that the universe just keeps going and going, and it's just full of stars, and you think you can come to the end. I try to imagine coming to the end of the universe, and actually there is no end because it just keeps on going, and how does it keep on going? How can it never stop? I mean, just the whole notion of infinity blew my mind, um, and I get that's the sense that I think David is having. He's having this experience of, of, of thinking about God and who God is, and he's like, oh, God, you know me. Like, it's, like you really do know everything about me, and where can I go? I can't go anywhere, because you're everywhere. And, 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 and what you do, how you act, is just beyond my imagining. You are so much beyond my imagining. David had never read uh, St. Augustine, and David had never read Thomas Aquinas. These are Latin theologians who come along much later, and these Latin theologians develop these theological dogmas and doctrines. Um, and one of the things I'll talk about is the omniscience of God. 
which means the all-knowingness of God and the omnipresence of God, the all-presentness of God and the omnipotence of God, you know, the all-powerfulness of God. Um, and they look back at a psalm like this and say, see, <laughs> uh, this is what God is like. Um, and yet David, I don't think, was trying to come up with a theology. I think David was trying to develop a theology. I think he was, in some sense, just caught up in this experience of God and realizing that God was beyond his own impossible imaginings, and it just stunned him. And to sense that God was everywhere that he potentially was, and that God knew him intimately, even weaving him together in his mother's womb, which is a profound kind of thing to think about. Um, and his response is that his spirit is lifted in praise and song. Unfortunately, the psalm takes, I mean, it, it leaves these rapturous heights of praise and, uh, you know, it's really good for the first 18 verses. And then you get to verse 19 and it just takes a nosedive <laughs> because then at that point, uh, David is like, I hate those who hate you and I wish that you would kill them. I hate them with perfect hatred. They are my enemies. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I wrestled with that this week and, and I realized, you know, this is an example of faith. I mean, it's, it's humans, it's, it's what it means to be human, right? David is sitting there rapturous about the, the awesomeness and the, 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 the awesome love of being known by God. And then he can't extend that to his enemies as if his enemies were also known by God. Um, it takes somebody like Jesus to come along and eventually change that dynamic and say, no, actually, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you and bless them. Right? David didn't quite get that, but the first 18 verses are great. But it, for me, again, that's faith. That's the nature of faith. It's this experience of God. It's, it's, being, it's, it's having one's mind blown by God and yet still having one's own limitations and the limitations of one's understanding. The second model of faith is that reading uh, that we get from Samuel. Um, our reading begins in chapter 3, but if you begin the story in chapter 1, verse 1, it's the story of a husband and wife, Elkanah, and, and his two wives, uh, Penea and Hannah. And the first wife uh, has a bunch of children, um, and, then, and Hannah is barren. She doesn't have any children. Um, but Elkanah loves her, and and so you know they go to the, the to worship at the temple of God, and you know uh, they're supposed to offer sacrifices, and Elkanah gives Penea and her children all the sacrifices they need, but to Hannah he gives a double portion, and so the the, the co-wife gets jealous and makes life difficult for Hannah, and so she is in the temple, just troubled and distressed, and her heart is aching, and she is just crying out in her spirit to God, and she's sitting there praying, just racked by the torment she's in and her lips are moving and the priest Eli sees her and he says, why are you making a drunken spectacle of yourself in the house of God? He totally misses her. He doesn't see her. He doesn't know her. He has contempt for her and she thinks she's just this drunk woman and she says, oh no, my Lord, you don't understand. I am deeply troubled. And I've been praying my heart out to the God. And Eli, to his credit, says, okay, go in peace and may God answer your prayer. And she feels lighter. I mean, she leaves the temple and the text says that Elkanah knew his wife Hannah and she conceived. And I love that euphemism, to know. Um... You know, Adam knew his wife Eve and they bore children. Elkanah knew his wife. It's a euphemism for sexual relations. And yet it indicates something more than just the pure physicality of sex. I mean, it, it's, it's to be seen, to be known, to be naked, to be vulnerable, fully vulnerable to the other and have the other delight in you. And that moment of intimacy where there's tenderness and compassion and delight and, and passion and, and physicality and just that sense of being known. Um, 
So Elkanah knew Hannah, (laughs) and Hannah conceived, and she gave birth to a son. And the text says the next year when there was time to go give uh, sacrifices, Hannah Hannah did not go with them. She said, I am going to stay here and wean my son and and, and nurture my son. And when he is weaned, then I will bring him to the temple and offer him to God. And so for, you know, until the boy is four or five years old, she is able to spend time with this, with her son. And then there's this moment where the the next time they go to the temple, she brings her son to the temple and she walks away, leaving him there. Because she's given him back to God. And every year she makes a linen aphod as he grows older, So he's got it as he is trained up and he is sacrificed. They call him a Nazarite. He's been sacrificed to service in the temple. And Elkanah knew his wife Hannah again. And the story says she has three more sons and two more daughters. And she has other children. So Samuel then, as a boy, has been consecrated to God and is is, is actually in the temple of God. And um, that's where our story today picks up. And says, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. People weren't hearing the voice of God in those days. Visions were not widespread. And Eli, the priest, his vision had begun to grow dim so that he could not see. But the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And so Samuel is lying in the temple, and apparently he's lying in front of the Ark of the Covenant. That's his role, is to kind of guard, to be present to the Ark of the Covenant. And the, the Israelites believed that the Ark, which was said to have held the, the stone tablets that Moses brought down from, or from Sinai, is in this golden box. And on the top of it, on the cover of the, the box, the lid of the box was fashioned out of two angels, two cherubim, and it formed kind of a seat. They called it the mercy seat, where God would come down and be present to the people. And so Samuel is there sleeping in this place where God becomes present. And one night he hears Samuel, Samuel. And he doesn't know how He doesn't know God's voice. He doesn't recognize God's voice. He hasn't learned what God's voice is like or how to hear God's voice. And so he goes running to Eli and he says, here I am, here I am. And Eli's like, what? (laughs) Why are you waking me up? And he's like, you called. And he's like, no, I didn't call. Go back to bed. So Samuel goes and goes back again. And again, he hears Samuel. So Samuel gets up and goes to Eli. And Eli's like, and he's like, here I am for you called me. And, And Eli's like, no, I didn't call you, son. You're hearing things. Go back to bed. And, 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 and the text says Samuel didn't know the Lord. He's having this experience, and he doesn't know how to interpret what his experience is. No one's taught him how to hear the voice of God. And so God again says Samuel, and he gets up and he goes, and, and, he, and Eli's like, okay, something else is going on here. I think God is talking to you. I think the voice of God is speaking to you. So If he calls again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel lays there, waiting in this posture of listening for the voice of God. And God says to him, Samuel. God calls him by his name, Samuel, because he is known by God. And Samuel says, speak, for your servant is listening. I think this too is an amazing kind of metaphor for faith and a posture of what faithfulness is this orienting of being open to listening for the voice of God, listening to learning and tra- learning how to discern what the voice of God might be, learning how to listen for, for, for what the wisdom of God might be. I mean, and having to distinguish that from all the other noises and all the other sounds in our world and all the other things that attract our attention and, and are, you know, 
and occupy our minds? How is it that we can train our ears to begin to hear the call to our souls, like the call to our spirits, right? Where, where God is calling us by name and saying, I know you. And for us to say, okay, I'm listening. This third example comes from the gospel text. This is the book of John. It's the beginning of the book of John where Jesus has been baptized and John has seen the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus. And then the text says the next day, Jesus was walking by them again. Apparently Jesus was still in the area. And two of John's disciples follow Jesus at a distance. So Jesus is just kind of walking along and John's disciples are back there and Jesus becomes aware of them kind of following them. And it's kind of like Jesus turns and he says, what are you looking for? It's the first thing Jesus says in the book of John. What are you looking for? And John's disciples are, where do you abide? Where do you live? Where's your home? And Jesus says to them, come and see. So today's gospel text is the third day. It's really the next day Jesus decides to go to Galilee and Jesus finds Philip. Um, and Jesus says to him, follow me. It's a famous thing. Jesus says to his disciples, follow me. So Philip finds Nathaniel, finds his friend Nathaniel, and says to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and the prophets said, Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth. And Nathaniel says to him, really? <laughs> Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And he's not asking a serious question of, oh, let's think about the good things that come from Nazareth. What are the good things? From... No, he's skeptical. He's like, can anything good come from Nazareth? It would be like, you know, somebody said to you, hey, I, I started listening to this teacher from Chilliwack. We found this really great teacher from Chilliwack. And you're like, can anything good from, come from Chilliwack? Seriously? A teacher from Chilliwack? And Nathaniel and Philip is like, yeah, Chilliwack. Come and see. So Philip and Nathaniel are kind of like moving towards Jesus, and Jesus sees Nathaniel from a distance. And again, it, you got to listen to the music of the voice here. Like the phrase is, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Like Jesus sees that there's a seriousness about Nathaniel. There's, a, there's an integrity to Nathaniel. Um, but I also think there's a playfulness in what he's saying. Like he gets that Nathaniel is is uh, kind of skeptical about the whole business. Um, and so he says, here is an Israelite in whom there is no seat. And Nathaniel says to him, where did you get to know me? And I think we need to hear Nathaniel saying, look, dude, do you know me? You think you know me? Where did you get to know me? You don't know me. What gives you the right to think that you know me? Um, and that's really important. It's like, you, how can you know me? You're just some dude. How can you know me? You don't have a clue. And Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And there's n no indication what happened under the fig tree. There's no backstory to what happened with Nathaniel under the fig tree. All we know is that somehow Nathaniel was under a fig tree and it was a significant moment for him. And the stuff I was reading this week, you know, indicated that sometimes rabbis were known to, to study in the shade of the fig tree. And so maybe it's an indication that Nathaniel was, um, you know, doing some sort of studying under the fig tree and, you know, in his own religiosity and seriousness and uh, i'm like well okay that sounds good but i imagine that there's this moment that happens for nathaniel in the fig tree he's like really as he's sitting there studying i i imagine he's had this existential moment where he's like seriously is any of this real <laughs> like do i believe any of this like are you really there god 
I mean, is there a there there or is that just empty space? Like, are you real? And do you see, do you understand what it is I'm going through? That's my conjecture. And we don't know what Philip happened for Nathaniel under the fig tree before Philip came to him. But it mattered to him. Whatever it is mattered to him and was significant for him. And when Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. Something happens to Nathaniel's skepticism. And instead of like, do you know me? He knows himself as being known. And he calls Jesus rabbi. He's like teacher. And he calls Jesus son of God. And he calls Jesus king of Israel. And these are all theological statements. These are all kind of profound theological statements about who Jesus is. Son of God, King of Israel, the Messiah, all these things. And you would think that Jesus at that moment would be like, yeah, now you get it. <laughs> Follow me. You're, you get it. Follow me. But Jesus is unimpressed, actually, by his theological statements um, and his insight into who God is. Or he, Jesus says, do you believe because I told you? that I saw you under the fig tree. I said, you will see greater things than these. And then Jesus says to them, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And then we go into chapter two. Um, and as you read that, as I read that, I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that's a greater thing? Like somehow that's a greater thing than Son of God, King of Israel? How is some sort of heaven being opened and angels ascending and descending greater? Why is that a good thing? Why is Jesus pointing to this as being somehow the goal or somehow something deeper and greater than just kind of this head knowledge? It's a reference to Genesis, actually. It's a reference to Jacob, where Jacob's coming back from, you know, his, his uh, finding wives, and he's, he's returning home uh, to his family in Israel, and he has this moment where he's sleeping by this stream, by this river, and he uses a rock as his pillow, which may influence how he slept. He's using this rock for his pillow, and in the middle of the night, he has this he sees this ladder, and it's the, it's the phrase Jacob's ladder, that's where it comes from. It's this ladder that it goes up to heaven, and he sees angels coming up and down the ladder. And he hears the voice of God blessing him in the dream. And when he wakes up, he says, surely God was in this place, and I didn't know it. And he calls the place Bethel. And he sets up a rock, a pillar of rocks or a pile of rocks to commemorate it as a sacred site where he was in the presence of God and experienced the presence of God, where he had this mystical experience of the presence of God. And this is what Jesus is pointing to. Jesus is pointing to, to Nathaniel and saying, do you believe that I am the son of God? Do you believe that I am the king of Israel? Do you believe that I am a teacher? Well, let me tell you, you are going to see heaven ripped open and see the messengers of God and see the, the, the chasm between heaven and earth um, torn apart and you will be in the presence of God. Which is actually similar to what David's experience was. I mean, it brings us back to well, Psalm 139 and, and what Samuel's experience was. All of these are are examples of David uh, having a sense of the of the presence of God near to him. And he's like, where can I go from your presence? Here you are. And the sense of being known by God, how, you know, it, it, such knowledge is too wonderful. He's like, you know my, my coming and going, you know my every word before I even say it. It's this sense of being surrounded by and being um, in the midst of and, and, and present to God. And, you know, Samuel sleeping in the presence of God and saying, speak, Lord for I am listening. 
And often we think of faith as being a matter of, I mean, often faith gets confused as being about knowledge about God, knowing things about God, believing certain things about God. And yet, over and over again, the examples, these biblical examples are that actually, though, faith is coming to know oneself as being known by God. It's not what you know about God. It's actually knowing yourself as being known by God, knowing yourself as being seen by God, knowing yourself as somebody whom God calls by name. Amen.